Hey there, and welcome to our future. Super excited to be part of this conference. Definitely a big fan of Matt and all the hard work that he's been doing. Let me start off by just saying thank you so much to Matt Powers for putting this whole conference together, putting so many wonderful minds into one place so that everyone can educate um, the different people that are interested in permaculture and organic growing and regenerative growing all into one place. It really is a, a wonderful event and I couldn't be more grateful to be part of it. So thank you so much for that. If you guys aren't familiar with me, my name is Stephen Reisner. Uh, I'm the owner and operator of Potent Ponics. I have the, uh, also the founder of the Growing With Fishes podcast. We have over 800 hours of educational content on there, which you can check out. We also host the, the virtual aquaponic cannabis conference there, which we just had uh, recently, and a whole bunch of other great educational resources. So be sure to check that out. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. I also have a great website over at potentponics.com. We have all different types of helpful resources, including the Open Nutrient Project, which we're going to touch on a little bit later on in this um, presentation. My specialty is aquaponics and living soil. So uh, there's a lot of overlap between those two worlds, and a lot of people don't realize how similar they are. Um, a lot of people think of them as you know, completely different methodologies of growing, and that's simply just not the case. They really are hyper similar. Only one is using aquatic soil, and the other one's using terrestrial soil. Uh, but functionally, when you look at the food webs and the food web structures of these different environments, they really are very similar, uh, much more than I think most people realize. And today we're going to talk about how to utilize uh, natural farming with both aquatic and soil systems. Um, we're going to start off by giving you guys kind of a little bit of an introduction on aquaponics, and then we're going to kind of get, get into some of the cool ways that we've been able to combine natural farming with what we've been doing, and then also some new ideas around natural farming that you guys may not have been exposed to before. Um, shout out to Chris Trump for uh, teaching me a bunch of those and, and collaborating and working together on a lot of that stuff. He's an amazing guy who's uh, doing a lot to share a lot with the world and also is a presentation later on in this uh, same conference as well. So um, first off, we're going to talk about aquatic soil. So this is kind of things like compost teas, um, microbially diverse ferments, uh, aquaponics, bioponics, all of those would constitute aquatic soils because you have all of these intricate and complicated food webs that are breaking these different microbial uh, micronutrients and nutrients down to make them available to the plants. Now, um, you can increase the total bioavailability of a nutrient solution by up to 80% if you simply add the right microbial solution. We've seen huge amounts of additional minerals uh, become bioavailable by combining some things like uh, IMO collections uh, and various you know healthy compost teas with our aquaponic systems to unlock even more nutrients for our plants than we were able to do traditionally. Which brings a whole new level and dynamic to growing in aquaponics. It also can help fill in some of the gaps in the different uh, mineralization that you often see with people that don't properly inoculate their systems. So um, when you think about aquaponics, think of it like an aquatic soil system more than a hydroponic plus aquaculture, which I think is a very poor way uh, of putting it, which is how it's been traditionally described today. So common aquaponic nutrient myths. Fish poop has everything that plants need. Fish poop was not formulated specifically to feed terrestrial plants. Um, it, it has problems, um, it has gaps, and it has issues with chemistry that you simply can't easily solved by engineering a fish food. Um, they, that, that problem, uh, many people have tried to solve it that way, and it simply doesn't work. You have things like manganese that get oxidized, uh, iron that gets oxidized, and they aren't rechelated at a, at a rate that makes up for that. So and that's just two examples of, of many in the food web that the plants need to thrive. Um, you don't need to add any nutrients. That's, again, not true. You have to add nutrients in one form or another, be it organic, or inorganic, um, you do have to supplement, again, manganese, iron, um, you know, calcium over time will be depleted. Uh, there's, there's a few others that you can absolutely use, uh, plant ferments uh, and, you know, Jadam and KNF to supplement those nutrients in the proper PPM ranges uh, that you would, uh, you know, or, or you can always go with salts, which, whichever you prefer. It doesn't necessarily mean inorganic salts either, there's, you know, langbanite, uh, and, and Epsom salt, those are two examples of organic salts. So uh, yeah, maxi crop with iron to fix your iron deficiency, don't do that. Every single person I've seen 
that had failure for arsenic was using a kelp product plus iron as their only iron source and then ended up way overboard on their arsenic. Don't do that. It's, and boron as well because, um, you know, you can overshoot that. When used as directed, uh, kelp extract is a great, and, and dried, preferably dried kelp, um, is a great additive for aquaponics or soil systems. Just don't go crazy with it. You know, it's no different anything else. You overdose anything, you're going to have problems. Okay, you don't need to monitor your nutrients once it's balanced. Again, this is crazy. You, you, anyone that knows, does large-scale farming knows you have to test the soil to know what's going on. It's the same thing with an aquaponic system. Adding microbes can cause imbalances. Again, we've simply not seen that. Um, you can absolutely blow out your systems with too much trichoderma, um, but it doesn't mean that you're going to kill the system. It just means that you're going to have a, a, a mineral imbalance when it comes to mineralization. Um, but we've had absolutely no problems with lactobacillus and IMO in our aquaponic systems. In fact, we've had huge results uh, in the positive direction. I'm sorry, guys, I have a little bit of a sinus thing today. Um, Over-engineering can fix nutrient problems. There's a bunch of these over-engineered systems that have a hundred different solenoid valves and numerous failure points. Stop with all that. The Pythagoras invented the Pythagorean cup, which is what we now call a bell siphon. I, you know. 2,000 years ago. We don't need to, to reinvent the wheel here. We have stuff that works without power. We don't need to, to rely on these over mechanical systems that often fail uh, and have way too many failure points. Uh, and it often, you know, can cost you a ton of money if that fails, especially if the wrong person's there monitoring the place. Um, rock dust is all you need for your nutrients. Rock dust also can be linked back to heavy metals. Um, be sure to test that if you're uh, especially on the cannabis side of things, but even if you're just a food person, you don't want those heavy metals either. Uh, fish foods can provide all that a plant needs um, just via just fish food. Again, the amount of potassium you need to properly do things like fruiting crops simply can't be put through the fish without causing cardiovascular issues. Uh, iron, you can't put through the fish enough because the digestive tract plus the oxygenation in the water will cause oxidation of the iron. So there's these chemistry problems that you simply can't get around by just doing it with fish food. You, you can absolutely do it by having, um, you know, good ferments of things or compost teas of, or compost extracts of things like um, stinging nettle is a great one for, for trace minerals for your manganese and your molybdenum and things like that. Um, or doing a liquid, a liquid um, uh, IMO fermentation, which we'll talk about later on in the, in the presentation as well. I'm a big fan of idiocracy, so I thought we'd make some, some fun memes with this. Um, <clears throat> so flood and drain beds are your media beds, uh, are typically are the best methodology for, especially for the home scale person, uh, doing aquaponics, the media bed offers a really good mineralization area for those mi um, mi microbes that, that just like in soil, convert all of that waste and other organic material into plant food. And if you think about it in that way, it's identical as to soil. Um, you know, in terms of, again, the, the, the you have different species filling those same roles in the food web, but again, there's still that, that microbial web, uh, unlike a hydroponic system that doesn't have those. And that's why the hydroponic lettuce and cannabis doesn't taste as good or have the same terpene profiles um, as stuff grown in living soil or aquaponics that has that microbial diversity that causes those secondary gene activations for the secondary metabolites uh, and triggers those genes so that they can produce all those extra compounds that we enjoy as flavor compounds or uh, medicinal compounds, depending on what it is that we're talking about. Um, you can easily adopt this to many different types of crops. <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, we have lettuce. Uh, you, you know, you can do in there any of your herbs, but you can also do things like fruit trees or or uh, tomatoes or peppers in the in the dual root zone plots. And you could also do. Uh, <coughs> I'm sorry. I apologize. Had a bit of a, a dusty morning making soil today. So you can also do things like uh, cloth pots and put them in there and then grow carrots, onions, potatoes, beets, radishes right in the top of your grow bed directly next to your lettuce and your peppers and, and whatever else. So you can grow root crops, you can grow you know, anything you want with this type of setup by just making minor adjustments into what you sit in the grow bed uh, in order to, to give the plants the right root zone. And that's really what it comes down to when you're adapting different crops to aquaponics is figuring out what root zone type it's going to, to thrive on best in aquaponics. Many things require a, um, 
soil, a certain percentage of soil, because they have to have a symbiotic mycorrhizal fungi, uh, or they have to have a, some other symbiote that, that requires that you know, so minimal amount of terrestrial zone, um, and, and they, they don't thrive. So that's why you have a couple of crops that don't do well on things like DWC, but the moment we put that in a, in a dual root zone pot on that DWC, it does fine, right? So um, th these, are, these are different ways that you can go about trying to adapt any type of crop uh, to your aquaponic system. So this is the methodology that we really like for the most types of crops is dual root zone. We can adapt the soil to any type of, of pH. So say, let's talk about blueberries or raspberries. I can just make an acidic soil in the upper portion, allow those roots to grow down through and the plant can still have those, um, you know, mycorrhizal fungi or, or other things that want, it wants to have on that more acidic root zone to give it those compounds that it needs to thrive while still getting all, you know, 80, 90% of the nutrient base from the fish waste. Um, so that can be a great way, you know, where you can grow many different types of crops that have radically different requirements directly next to each other in the same system um, and having them all thrive at the same time. So it gives you a ton of control over what you want to do. Uh, you can top water nutrients in um, if you want to adjust them or make different nutrient so solutions to, to give the plants additional nutrients in a different feed rate or pH range uh, to help that individual plant thrive. It also gives you the terrestrial microbiome and the aquatic microbiome, which means you have double the different microbial triggers uh, on those uh, genes, just like we just talked about, um, to give it the most diverse uh, secondary metabolite expression possible. Um, I've, you know, aquaponics and living soil, in particular dual roots and aquaponics, gives you the highest terpene possible expressions in the plant because it triggers the most number of secondary genes. Um, there's no other way that you can't replicate this in soil because you don't have that aquatic microbiome. Uh, you can't replicate this in, um, you know, DWC aquaponics because you don't have that terrestrial microbiome. Um, so uh, this really does give you the best advantages of both worlds uh, and really give you the, uh, the, the, you know, maximum possible production. It also eliminates the needs for things like decoupled systems and other things which only add expense and, and you know, just shouldn't be used. Um, Dual root zone flooded water levels. Um, so when we're talking about dual root zone, um, we're look, <clears throat> we generally use a three to five gallon pot, uh, sometimes a little bit bigger, uh, but most of the time, uh, you know, things like trees and things like that will do that, which I'll show you later on in the presentation. But for the sake of conversation here, we have the terrestrial zone and the upper portion of this pot. Um, you can see there's about a half an inch to an inch dry layer um, uh, above, <clears throat> above the water line. And then we have a layer of burlap, which holds the soil and keeps that from growing through into the media. The roots penetrate through um, and can get to the water and grow right through the burlap without any types of issues, but the burlap keeps that soil from going down and wicking water. We don't want water to wick up into the soil zone. Um, you know, we want to be able to water that and maintain moisture content separately in the upper portion and either through a drip system or a ring sprayer or hand watering. Um, you can you can maintain moisture levels in that upper portion um, and allow those plants to thrive and, and be fed even top fed additional nutrients if need be uh, on a per plant basis so if you had different flowers or crops or cannabis strains that needed different nutrient feedings you can feed each of them a different regimen without any types of problems with the fish or, or anything like that and how you'd go about determining the amount of water that you'd put in the upper soil zone is Take one of your pots without any plants in it, pour in a measured amount of water that you know measured amount, use a measuring cup or something like that, until the water just starts to drip out of the bottom, right? So that's your saturation rate, how many liters or ounces of, of, of water. So let's just say for the sake of argument, the saturation rate is 16 or 64 liter, uh, ounces of water. So we're going to cut that in half to 32 ounces of water. That's roughly how much we want to use uh, for watering uh, uh, in the future. Uh, one, for any of the soil zones. Now you can go up to a third more than that uh, if you really want to kind of saturate it without any kind of uh, worrying about it dripping out the bottom, but at least now you have a gauge on, you know, how much is too much when you're watering the, the soil zone, if that makes sense. So hopefully that, that can help you determine uh, the volume that you need to water uh, for those upper soil zones. 
And you can see here, this is the very first test that we did with dual root zone pots with living soil. Uh, you can see on the left, the tomato is quite a bit bigger than the one on the right. Uh, the tomato on the left uh, had 42 more flower sites and it had 38% more fruit uh, on the plant than the, the tomato that was just in the media bed. And this is what the roots look like. So you can see here the media bed only plant had very small roots. It didn't need to make a big root zone. Uh, it was just feeding basically more or less hydroponically. Uh, you can see just by the other plant having access to those soil microbes, it changed the root morphology of that plant and allowed the root system to become much, much, much larger. Uh, given And there were clones off the same mom tomato plant uh, from our showroom with the same number of leaves. They weighed almost identical amount of weight. Like we tried to make them as, as identical as possible when we put them into the system for the trial. So it really does go to show uh, how much of a difference, uh, you know, changing the microbiome of the root system can have uh, on actual plant growth. Here's some examples of some commercial dual root zone setups. Uh, the one on the left is a DWC uh, uh, pots on top of that. And the one on the right is a media bed, Marty's uh, AP Meds uh, facility. And you can see here, here's some more tests in uh, uh, Colorado. Um, you can see here is a giant cabbage uh, that we grew in dual root zone pot. And then also uh, how we set up our fruit trees. So we had fruit trees set up in these barrels on cinder blocks. Uh, and you can see the plumbing kit there on the side. Um, we had a flood and drain kit that would flood and drain the bottom portion of it you know, once a day or so. Um, and then it had a soil above that. So it was about two thirds soil to one third flood and drain on that particular design. So with the, t the trees, they do better with a deeper soil zone uh, and a shallower flood and drain than the uh, other crops. So if you're really gonna go with something like that, fruit trees, anything like that, you're far better off with a shallow flood and drain in a much deeper soil zone. Here's what I was talking about with the root crops. There's some beets and carrots in, a, in one of our media bed trays. It's actually just a concrete mixing tray that we ran down to a tough tote. So you can do something as simple as that and plumb in your aquarium and you're good to go. You can put those freeloading fish to work. So this is um, uh, what we like best for aquaponic cannabis production, but also for you know, peppers, tomatoes, uh, all kinds of other things. Um, if, if that's what you're looking to do, uh, you know, flowers, if you're doing seed crops and stuff for seed production, doing this type of method so you can push the numbers a little bit more is going to be a, a, give you much better results. Also, if you're growing in aquaponics outside and you're growing things like tomatoes, peppers, other things, the heavy weight of the base of it really helps them keep from getting blown over in the, in, when you get windy days. Uh, and your, your outdoor beds um, without any kind of problem. So that's been another big benefit uh, on that. We've also noticed a big res uh, increased resistance in things like powdery mildew uh, and, um, and other secondary mold infections uh, in the plant. Um, we, we, with, the aquapon or with the soil zone, it seems like some, the, some of the extra fungi and things like that in the soil zone really help activate those uh, plant's immune system to be a little bit more uh, resistant to a lot of those molds. So that's been another big advantage that we've seen uh, in side-by-side -side comparisons. It definitely gives us the best growth rates for sure. And it is the most commonly used method in commercial uh, cannabis production for aquaponics because we can adapt any strain. You can give me any strain you want to, and we can immediately dial in what its feeding needs are in that soil zone and, and still you know, feed it just the same as 80, 85% of the base uh, from everything else in the, uh, in the you know, main water zone. So it really allows us a ton of flexibility on what we can and can't do um, in terms of, of cultivars. So we can, you know, a lot of the other methodologies like DWC only or some of the media bed only ones, they have to do a lot more phenu hunting than we do. We can take whatever the hot strain this month is and immediately adapt it into mass production within a month or so uh, once we figure out what nutrient needs it, needs it has. We've also done things like giant pumpkins. It's another example of stuff that we've grown in aquaponics. Some more commercial uh, aquaponic cannabis production. Um, obviously it looks like a forest of, of trees. Um, that's what a healthy system looks like. All right, so you can see here we have uh, dual root zone cucumelons out in California. They grew really well. We have uh, the um, calcium and eggshell around it is actually for the snails. You know, snails that crawl in at night and, or, and uh, would eat the plants. This is a commercial aquaponic cannabis facility in Oklahoma. This is um, Vertical Aquaponics. I've been working with them for quite a long time. Buddy Bain's the a grower down there. We have some dual root zone um, uh, elderberries. Now this is one that Marty and I both have had incredible results with in aquaponics as well. 
Um, so we get massive production. You can see how many berries are on that plant there. Um, and so this is uh, just starting off in the dual root zone, and you can see here the progression of the growth. Uh, he also had um, um, elderberries, uh, just like we did the first year, uh, whereas a lot of times it can take the multiple years before they start producing flowers. Uh, we have not found that to be the case in aquaponics. We can get really heavy yields uh, multiple times a year uh, in the aquaponic systems. And there you go, another picture of Marty's. And then you can see this is uh, ones I was working with in Oklahoma. It's massive, massive uh, elderberry plants. You can also adopt it to DWC. So you can see here there's a formerly a lettuce facility that we adopted to cannabis. We have some monster moms there uh, that have been growing for quite a while. Uh, and we're just creating dual root zone pots and sticking them right on top. The one thing I would say is uh, from this picture here on top is get some bamboo and just make an X across the bottom just to help support the weight, especially as they get older, six, seven, you know, five, six months in, the weight of them can start to push down on that center area. So having some kind of more tough support that just has an X across the bottom so those roots have something to push against um, helps quite a bit. Um, also, really good for cold climate. So if you're in cold weather places, Canada, northern United States, Europe, things like that, um, the extra water volume from a DWC system uh, will um, give you extra thermal mass, meaning that you can maintain the heat of the greenhouse a little easier. It's also very energy efficient to use heat exchangers and solar heaters uh, to, to get a ton of heat into the system uh, that way in terms of keeping the water heat uh, hot without uh, spending much money. And you can also uh, dual loop that uh, heat exchanger into a gas or propane um, uh, backup water heater, instant water heater as a backup system just in case it's you know nighttime and the temperature needs to come up or you have some other emergency with the system and it has to, you know, gives you a backup to keep it from getting too cold. Um, DWC systems do cost more per year to run, you use more water. You also have to dose more nutrients with things like iron and other things like that that you end up having to dose with. So keep that in mind. Um, they do cost a little bit more, but it can be worth it if you're in a cold climate, you can make up those costs and energy costs, which are you know usually much, much more expensive. So uh, we don't really like them in the tropics. Uh, I'm currently in Thailand, but we, uh, we really like them for you know northern United States and Canada because they do retain that heat so well. Uh, it can really cut down on the overhead in the wintertime. Here's another uh, aquaponic uh, cannabis facility. It's that same facility in, in Oklahoma. It's looking real good. This is uh, Vertica Aquaponics in Oklahoma. You can see some monster, monster plants uh, in there uh, growing nice and well. These are auto flowers. You can see the moms in the back there. Um, they, in the wintertime, they have a little bit fewer moms because they don't need them quite as much. Uh, and uh, they run some autos. So five controls of dual root zones. It allows you to dose the water with nutrients if you want to, uh, obviously within fish safe ranges. Allows you to dose the soil, so you can dose that with whatever you want because you're not going to get that in the water unless you really go crazy with the watering. Uh, allows you to use custom soil mixes. You can get time release um, uh, soil and fertigation. Allows for foliar sprays if you want to go that route. I don't per like that route anymore. I only foliar with, with pest control stuff. We don't foliar with anything else anymore. Um, and then allows for varying fish foods. So you can lean more towards heavy protein if you're trying to push high nitrogen or back off on the high protein and move towards um, more omnivorous fish uh, species or even herbivorous fish for, for flour. So um, you can kind of play with that depending on how large of a system you have and how many fish tanks and different species of fish you have. You can run a, you know, carnivores for veg and, you know, omnivore herbivores for, for flour. Um, if you're really getting to big scales, it can, it can make sense to do that, you know, just to reduce nutrient costs. We get a huge increase in cannabinoids in aquaponics. You can see we get a meaning we're 15 to 35% increase in THC um, and CBD. We've seen as much as a hundred percent increase. And then in media beds, um, we also uh, uh, see up to a 30% uh, increase in production over DWC. Um, so if you do have the option, media beds are better, um, but DWC can still provide plenty of benefits if you're in that. Or hey, if you have an existing aquaponics facility or lettuce facility, or you're going to purchase one, uh, you can rapidly adapt it into production. We've also seen a big increase in THCV, CBDV, and CVG uh, compared to uh, soil controls in some of the strains that we've tried so far. And then we've seen up to a 300% increase in total terpenes. 
uh, again, that, that increase in microbial biodiversity, uh, we've seen anywhere from a 45 to 78% uh, increase on average, but as much as a 300% in certain cultivars. And you can see here in the back, uh, we have a supplemented system where we added just a small amount of additional nutrients uh, to the system, uh, or to the top feeding of the pots, uh, all of them on the same shared aquaponic system. And then the ones here in the front were only given uh, vermicompost tea. Um, so you can see they're not uh, nowhere near as thriving as the ones in the back that had just a little bit of extra nutrients to them. So um, you can absolutely grow and get to a finished product if you don't supplement, but I don't think it takes a rocket science to tell which one of those grow beds you'd rather have in your garden. So, you know, anyone that tells you you don't have to supplement aquaponics, just go ahead and show them this picture and, uh, and then ask them what they're doing. You can see here the left two buds are uh, supplemented with just a small amount of additional potassium and phosphorus. Uh, and then the ones on the right here were not supplemented. Uh, again, you can still smoke both, but your yields are radically different. Okay, fish tanks. So we have the best use, uh, uh, you know, 40 gallons or bigger are really what you want to go to get to a serious aquaponic system. Smaller than that, you can still do it. I've done as small as a two and a half gallon aquaponic system, but they, um, they, they tend to just have problems. You don't have enough water volume to prevent pH from fluctuating quickly or anything like that. So it really, it does get easier the bigger the system is in terms of water chemistry. It's, it's harder to screw up and harder to overdose things when you have larger doses and larger volumes. Um, you can use uh, anything uh, food safe. So, you know, 55 gallon drums, aquariums, old jacuzzis, bathtubs, whatever you can get your hands on. As long as it holds water, it's fine. Um, uh, you know, you can get so many different nice plastic containers now between the reef tank aquarium industry and everything else. But oftentimes Craigslist too can be a great way to get, you know, old aquariums or 55 gallon drums that were used for kitchen oil or whatever else that you can go ahead and reuse. Or you can get really giant tanks too, like the ones we got here at this project in Oklahoma. So it's a 1200 gallon fish tank. So you can also drill, so when you're talking about how to flow the water out of the fish tank and into the aquaponic system, you got a couple of options. So one of the options is to uh, trace and drill the aquarium and go ahead and put in your overflows directly into the back of the aquarium. Um, this is my preferred method. I'm also really used to drilling glass, so it doesn't intimidate me. I definitely did before I had done it a few times, but um, go ahead, just make sure you buy an extra tank or two, or you know, just know that you don't feel bad if you break one the first time. The biggest thing is not to put pretty much any pressure on the glass when you get to the very end. Just let it very carefully grind the last little bit of it out. That, that's usually where, where you, if you're gonna crack it, that's usually where they crack it. And as you can see here in the photo, we, we took our Sculpey clay, we made a little ring around it, we traced out the uh, outside of the back of the um, bulkhead there uh, for the, the inner part, not the outer part. If you do the outer part, it's not going to work. If you do the inner part, it'll work just fine. Uh, just outside where the teeth are and the threaded part. So you trace that on the end of the aquarium, put your clay around it, fill it with water, and then you can go ahead and drill that with your glass drill bit. Uh, pop the bulkhead in there, and then you have your overflow for your uh, for your aquarium. And that's how most pet stores are, are set up. Alternatively, if that, does, if that intimidates you, you can buy what is called an overflow box like this and, and take any aquarium and immediately have a nice flow through drain that you can now uh, plumb, plumb off of and run that down into a centralized sump uh, where you can put a, uh, a pump and have a T on it to go to your aquaponic system and then to your aquarium uh, and back again. So it's the easiest kind of setup. It's called a chop system. It really is the easiest uh, design for, for aquaponics, especially if you're just getting used to this. And you can get these overflow boxes at any aquarium store that's worth its weight and salt. Um, you know, you can get. There's lots of little fun systems too. You know, uh, Jack from Aqua Sprouts, good friend of mine, he sells a really great aquarium kit for, for schools. I got, um, uh, um, uh, we, we did a bunch of beta testing with him back when he first did that. Those are great too if you're an educator. Um, they have a, a bunch of little cool stuff. I know he's got some new systems out that I haven't had a chance to see in person yet. And then on the top left is just someone made a Rubbermaid tub one. Now, you can see in this diagram they put heavy weights on top of the aquarium with the screen. 
Don't ever do that. Aquariums can't support weight long term. It'll work fine for a little while, and then the glass will slowly warp, and then the, the front or back will just explode on you one day. Don't do that. Uh, make sure any weight that's more than a you know an ounce or two has to be supported by something other than the aquarium glass. Do not, and you see this all the time in, in pictures online. Do not support any you know considerable weight on on top of a glass pane for any length of time. It's just really really bad. Um, you're you're, you're going to have a really big disaster at some point. It might not happen for six or eight months, but it will break eventually. And, you know, you can always do like this guy did here. He took a cutting board, drilled some holes in it, put some party cups, and call it a day. You know, you don't have to go crazy. You can get all, all that whole thing right there at the dollar store. You know what I mean? Like, you don't have to overthink it. So for sumps, you know, especially if you're at the home scale, tough totes work fine. Um, you can also use aquariums, uh, IBC totes. All of those things work really well. Um, again, just have something that's reasonably easy to clean if you have a problem and where your pump's gonna live um, so that you can put either a float valve on there or um, just monitor the water volume in there so that the pump doesn't run dry. You can see here we have uh, building our own system. So this is a, a workshop that Josh Rutherford and I did out at his farm in uh, um, uh, Washington State. You can see here we have a, a whole plumbing system with the, the drains in the bottom. We have the liner uh, in the pond there and partially filled and then we're running the, uh, the um, building out the rest of the frames for the grow beds and then we're going to go ahead and put the drains on that and, uh, and connect that all together. So the main parts that we're going to talk about today is you have the fish tanks, the grow beds, the pumps, the pipes, the valves, the bulkheads, uh, glue or hose clamps, fish and fish food, um, freshwater aquarium test kits, media, pots, soil and plants. That should cover most of your stuff that you need. Um, you know, maybe pipe glue. You might want to also add. To, oh, we have that on there. Never mind. Um, you can see here. This is just a tough tote, a concrete mixing tray, a fountain pump, uh, a standpipe, and a media bed or some media that we had from leftover at work, um, and was able to build a whole small patio-style aquaponic system. We can see little dual root zone pots for our peppers and our tomatoes and our stevia, uh, and uh, it came out really, really nice. And again, this is, here's the full build list here. So if you want to replicate this at home, um, you can do that fairly easily. Um, again, it's nothing, nothing that you should be intimidated by. Uh, you, know, you can build this whole thing in uh, about half an hour. And that's that same grow bed uh, a little bit later on once everything really had a chance to take off. So uh, again, you, you can build these things out of anything. This is another small system that I did for a school district in California. Uh, they were looking for something the wood shop could build and then the, the biology students could use for their aquaponic systems. Um, so this is the build out. Now, again, those prices are pre-COVID. So, um, you know, obviously wood and stuff like that's a little bit more money now. But uh, but at least you have the build list. So if you want something like that, um, you can go ahead and, uh, and check that out. Uh, and then you can see that built here. So if, if, if you want to go ahead and build that yourself. Uh, you can check that out. So fish species, and it comes to fish species, you can see here is a big giant tilapia. Um, koi and tilapia really are the best ones to start off with if you aren't familiar or you're, you're newer to the hobby. Um, uh, tilapia in particular uh, are, are pretty durable, um, but koi as well are very durable. Uh, if you're looking for the best ROI, it's definitely butterfly koi. Um, they do have the best return on, on dollar spent uh, to inch gained. So uh, if you're looking for what's going to make the most money and you're not trying to harvest the fish, um, it definitely is your, your best option. If you're into you know, cannabis growers, that's pretty much your only option because you can't get a meat processing license. So um, you know these are things to think about when you're planning your, your business. Or considering this at your farm, you know, if you, uh, uh, and what type of farm you have. Uh, now, panfish can be another good one, bluegill, um, yellow perch, uh, sunfish, all those guys can be really, really good for, um, uh, you know, small scale production, especially in more rural areas. You know, in Arkansas and Oklahoma, they were really, really popular and there wasn't a ton of other competition growing those. So 
Um, the plate price was, was pretty good when we sold them to restaurants. Um, again, meat processing license is required to process fish, so consider that you know if you are a cannabis producer that you can't get that uh, without having an off-property location. So um, you know keep that in mind depending on what your final plans are. Um, again, another good option is uh, an aquaculture license or a, a pet trade import license, export license, because then you can trade them, you can sell them uh, in between states, uh, sometimes in between countries. Uh, and you can do all kinds of exotic fish that way or, or sell them just as pet trade fish. Uh, and that tends to be the best um, monetization when you're looking at pure uh, non-harvesting fish monetization is doing larger tropical fish or, um, you know, arowanas or arapaimas or snakeheads, things like that, depending on what country you're in and the legality of those fish. So really good fish to use, tilapia, koi, goldfish, paku, plecos, perch, catfish, arapaimas, arowanas, sway, bluegill, sunfish, Chinese hyphen sharks. Uh, fish that don't do well, trout, salmon, striped bass, ornamental shrimp, um, prawns. Um, the nutrient ranges are just not good for them. Trout and salmon, they don't like that high level of potassium long term. Um, you can very easily kill them. You can pull it off, but you screw up it all on their toast. Um, Ornamental shrimp uh, and, and prawns, again, the nutrient ranges that you need for a healthy plant system simply are outside of the range that's healthy for them. Uh, tropical fish and crayfish, and again, uh, you can do a lot of tropical fish, but the little guys, tetras and stuff like that, again, they can't handle the nutrient ranges that we're running for some of these uh, these plants. So consider that um, when, you're, when you're trying to plan out what you want to raise. So aquaponic chemistry overview, generally you want to keep the pH between 6.4 and 6.8. It's extremely critical um, that you don't get too high or too too much well, too much above or below that range. A pH up, so I really like calcium carbonate and potassium silicate. It really does give you the best nutrient results uh, and the best grow results in your garden. Um, there's plenty of other methodologies, but I really think at the end of the day that that is the best one. There, you really there's not really any argument when you look at any of the side by sides. So you know it's kind of a, at least a 15% difference over all the other combinations. So um, iron is almost always the first thing that gets depleted. Um, again, because we talked about the oxidation factor, uh, iron humate, iron citrate, or DTPA iron are your only options really for adding iron. You can add some of it through ferments, but again, just like all of those, it does get quickly oxidized. So even if you add it as a fermented option, it's still not going to work for any length of time more than the rest will. Uh, molybdenum and manganese are often stripped out pretty quickly, uh, especially by plants that have a lot more secondary metabolites, or uh, also with aquaponics because uh, molybdenum is used for nitrogen, the nitrogen processing of the plants. And the plants are plowing through a lot more nitrates um, than normal. You know, the nitrate to ammonia ratio is a little bit different in, in aquaponics, so they have to convert that nitrate back to ammonia, which they don't mind, but they need the nutrients to do that so you can pretty quickly strip out molybdenum and it's something that i see almost across the board um, with with new clients and when we test it the molybdenum almost always is stripped out and that leads to things like your red sailor's lettuce not being red your purple broccoli not being purple um, anthocyanins which is your purple compounds um, or one of the purple compounds in plants but the, one of the main ones in vegetables and cannabis also requires molybdenum for its production so um, if you don't have that, uh, you're going to um, uh, uh, enough molybdenum, you're going to have color problems. You're not going to get the same right color for your sales appeal that you want for your produce if you're a farmer's market grower, things like that. It's one of the biggest nutrient problems. I think people for far too long have been recommending way too low molybdenum levels um, across the soil, aquaponics, you name it. I think people are, I don't understand why they don't dose it more. It doesn't make any sense, at least to me. Uh, because of the prime... <laughs> Uh, primary source of, oh, we talked about that. Um, manganese is another, oh, we talked about that. Um, overdosing zinc is another one. You can easily kill your fish if you go crazy. Uh, and then uh, you can't use any of the yucca extract. And just in general, outside of aloe, avoid saponins with fish. Um, there are uh, like karanja and stuff like that can be used with fish, but karanja also messes with the sex hormones of the fish. So um, again, I just the only safe uh, wetting agent that you can use uh, or safe... Um, uh, what's the other word I was thinking of? Anyways, I'll think of it. Um, that you can use as, as uh, aloe, but avoid yucca. I mean, a couple drops of yucca will kill everything in your system. 
All right, uh, potential of hydrogen, your pH. Uh, ideal, again, for aquaponics is 6.4, 6.8. Um, it's totally normal for your system to drop over time. Um, your system, if it's properly cycled, nitrogen cycle is, is going and healthy, will slowly go down over time. That's why you have to dose a pH up of some kind to maintain the pH. And this allows us to add calcium and potassium to the system in a passive way that doesn't negatively impact the health of the fish or the plants in any way. If you're getting more than a 0.2 pH, uh, change from daytime to nighttime, uh, then you absolutely could have alkalinity that is too low, which is a separate issue. Um, but that can be a good way to, to check for that as looking at the pH over the course of a day. If it's, you know, you're seeing a pretty a radical shift, uh, you know, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 or more, um, definitely time to add a little potassium bicarbonate to, to, to boost those carbonate rates back up, to stabilize the pH. So again, I'm really big fan of potassium silicate, potassium carbonate, and occasionally potassium bicarbonate just to get a little extra um, uh, a carbonate into the water. Uh, I don't like potassium hydroxides, calcium hydroxides. They're way too caustic. They're expensive. Uh, and um, they also uh, are just, why are you using industrial chemicals? Use the food grade stuff, you know? Uh, calcium carbonate's used in bread leveling. Like hydroxides are poison. Like You just don't want to use that stuff. And then uh, potassium carbonate, also used in food making. You can use it, but again, you can use potassium silicate. It's much better in terms of plant growth. So for pH down, you know what works really good? Lactobacillus. Lactobacillus is very acidic. Um, so you can use labs for smaller systems as pH down. Uh, phosphoric acid or muriatic acid also can work as pH down. Do not use vinegar, citric acid, or nitric acid. Uh, all of those have um, very negative impacts on the system long term. So, uh, and the microbials. So, avoid those. So, next up, we're going to talk about how that relates to natural farming now that we've kind of gone over the basics. So, why would you use natural farming in your facility? Uh, it lowers the costs uh, um, of your overall plant production. Um, you can uh, treat many different fungal issues with it, with things like IMO or lactobacillus. Uh, both can treat a wide range of fungal problems in systems or even prevent them outright. Um, can treat things like E. coli and salmonella. Uh, we've done a ton of different um, uh, tests with aquaponic systems that had non-human pathogenic E. coli uh, and were able to completely eliminate all of them within uh, 14 to 30 days of detection uh, with just lactobacillus dosing. So. Um, that can be a great way to improve food safety in the long term, which is something I think we're going to see more and more often. I think long term, you're even going to see it required for food safety protocols for aquaponic system just because of how easy and cheap it is for uh, maintaining food safety. If you're running any kind of larger hydroponic facility, absolutely would be dosing lactobacillus every other week at 1 to 1,000 just to cover my own butt liability-wise. Um, you can also uh, dramatically increase mineralization of your system. We talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, and also increase the uh, health of your soil, you know, and help prevent diseases and viruses and a whole bunch of other great stuff. Um, can help cre increase your place, plant's base resistance to different diseases and can also be used to help replace some of the missing parts of your soil food web and the aquatic, uh, not soil food web, but aquatic food web. Microbial applications. So if we're going to foliar apply microbes, I really like, and I know they're not the best company, and they're not the best units, I'll be frankly honest with you. They're a little bit cheaply made, but they work really well, and for the price point, I don't care if we burn through one every six to 12 months using them heavily. Um, the uh, four gallon rainmakers work really well. Uh, I really like the sprayers on them, and they're at like 180 bucks, so they're, they're not breaking the bank. Um, you can get extra battery packs for them, uh, and they're just a really nice backpack sprayer. Um, for what they do. Uh, they're not also not over pressuring or killing or micronizing or atomizing any of the microbes. So we found really good results with the microscope when we were applying using that particular sprayer. And it's the one I think is the easiest to get your hands on in the United States, at least. I'm also a big fan of the triple and quad head sprayers. I really think that's the better way to go. Uh, I wouldn't buy one if it didn't have that. I wouldn't recommend getting one. Also make sure you have a really accurate scale. Most of the people that are watching this uh, probably have a good scale for one reason or another. Uh, hopefully not the two, you know, one that goes up to the uh, the hundredth of a gram, but uh, hopefully just a tenth of a gram once. Uh, 
I'm just kidding. Um, anyways, don't use foggers or atomizers when you're using microbial applications because you will absolutely cause problems uh, and, and kill off a large percentage of all the microbes that you spend a ton of work and time trying to create. Lactobacillus serums. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So in aquaponic systems, we've seen a 12 to 20 percent increase in growth rates on both fish and plants using lactobacillus. We've also noticed it helps eliminate a lot of the fish waste that makes it past the filter and into the grow beds or underneath the raft beds in the DWC systems with lettuce. It helps just break that all down and turn it back into liquid nutrients again. So um, that, along with uh, the IMO uh, additions, can really help uh, just in, again, increase overall system cleanliness uh, by allowing the microbes to, to do all the hard work. Um, ab actively consumes, and we've seen this now, uh, pathogens like Pythium, E. coli, Salmonella, and other human pathogens, and eliminates them completely from the system when dosed at the proper rate, at a 1 to 1,000 uh, every other week. You don't have any of these issues anymore in your system. And again, you can drink the stuff. You can't do that with anything else that eliminates all of those. Uh, increases beneficial microbes and, uh, uh, and network growth in terms of mineralization and diversity. Uh, increases plant growth. Again, we talked about that. Um, most labs takes three to five days to create. It depends on your water, your air temperature and water, water temperature and how big of a batch you're creating. Um, again, great way natural pH down. You can even use it in aquariums. I know quite a few people that are using this now in their um, uh, aquariums for the uh, shrimp, uh, especially the little micro shrimps, the Neocardinia and Cardinias. Um, for maintaining health and helping eliminate some of the, the fungal issues that they have uh, with the eggs. So, um, you know, you can use it even on sensitive uh, shrimps and stuff like that without any kind of problem. So you can see here um, the, lac the lactobacillus at the bottom, the curds at the top, and there's many different ways that you can make lactobacillus. So you can use the probiotics you get at the drugstore. You can use EM1. You can get kefir from your uh, your local health food store. Uh, you can rice collect like traditional uh, Master Cho um, uh, collection. So you can use all, or you can combine all of those methods. Uh, but all of them are diverse lactobacillus colonies uh, that have, you know, the kefir and the su super lactobacillus probiotics in particular have a huge biodiversity range when it comes to lactobacillus. Now, why is that important to have a biodiversity in your lactobacillus species? It's not just so that you don't have a do over dominance of the one species. Um, it's also because what else do lactobacillus produce in large amounts? Vitamin B. What does vitamin B do to plants? It's a growth accelerator. So you can create kind of an organic PGR, for lack of a better term, um, and growth accelerator that allows you to speed up the growth of your plants while eliminating mold spores and, and, and bad fungal pathogens all at the same time. And, and, and even bacterial pathogens because it loves to feed on a lot of those bad guys as a food source. So let's use them as an ally in our garden. You know, I, it, I, I, I don't understand why this isn't even more of a, a thing on the, in the organic side. I know some people are into it, but I know that some people are still a little averse to it. I've also heard people call it um, bacteria from cow stomachs and all kinds of, you know, how do you think they got in the cow stomach from the grass that the cow ate? <laughs> That's where it came from. So uh, you get all kinds of kooky ideas when it comes to Latin because it's a milk-based product. Um, you know, different theories that people have on, 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 uh, on what the stuff is and, and what it'll do. So here's a, a quick recipe for labs. Uh, I'm not going to go ahead and read it just because uh, for, for the sake of time, but um, you guys can screenshot this and use it for your own garden. If you do use this for educational purposes, I please just ask that you leave the, uh, the little watermark up at the top right. Uh, but I don't mind if people do that as long as they send it. You can check out here the plant lab. So we've been taking a lot of the different plant materials and just instead of doing an FPJ or making a tea out of it, we'll actually ferment it in lactobacillus. And what we've noticed is this breaks down a lot of the different plant hormones and isolates them. Things like phycocyanin, which is another really big growth enhancer uh, in plants. It's your base building block for your, your chlorophyll groups. Um, and all kinds of other wonderful compounds do get isolated in pretty heavy amounts uh, and still remain plant available when you ferment plant materials and algae uh, with um, uh, lactobacillus. So it can be a new tool in your la uh, um, natural farming uh, toolbox for creating new additional ways to add mineral compounds from plant material and plant sources to your garden. 
uh, and we're working on mapping out more of these nutrient content wise as I have time. Um, we're currently building out a, a new lab and things like that here in, in Thailand. Um, once we get a, a little bit further into production, we'll be able to, to test a lot of the stuff in house. So we're really excited about that and something that I'm hopefully, hopefully going to get a chance to really dig my teeth into here in a couple of months. Um, yeah, again, a lot of these compounds cannot be isolated in, a, in an energy efficient way. Phycocyanin, for example, is typically isolated using high heat. We can do that completely without any heat. So uh, it can offer many more sustainable solutions for a lot of things that have other options for production, but um, this can be much less energy intensive and much more sustainable long term. And here's a quick and dirty recipe for uh, plant labs. Again, you can adjust this any way you'd like to. Um, you can add more, add less. Like I, I'm just trying to give you a scaffolding or like a, a, an initial recipe that you can modify uh, to get the same kind of results that we've been seeing with some of these different inputs and compounds. So definitely check that out. And uh, just like um, many of the other um, uh, things uh, in this presentation, feel free to modify it or whatever, or even use it for your own education. Again, just uh, make sure you leave the, the little uh, thing up at the top. But I really want to get this information out there and uh, something that I, I definitely think can be the solution to um, creating organic mineral solutions that have similar total bioavailable PPMs to the bottled stuff you buy at a store, but, you know, and give those same kind of instant results, but be something that you can drink and be organic and, and produce on your own property rather than having to buy it. So uh, isolated plant compounds, just like we were talking about the phycocyanin. So that's what phycocyanin looks like when you isolate it with uh, lactobacillus. So you can see the curds on top floating. Uh, obviously, we're straining those out in the picture, but you can see how neon blue that or phycocyanin is. And that uh, really helps accelerate plant growth. It helps re resurrect dead and damaged plants. Um, you know, and there's many other things that you can do depending on what plant inputs you're using for lactobacillus fermentation. You can get so many different cool compounds and we don't even know all the different ones that you can do utilizing this method, but what other microbes can you utilize this type of tech with to isolate other things? So to me, it's kind of like a machine and we put it in there and see what comes out the other side. It's like a, like a Rube Goldberg machine where you put microbes and plant material in and all these things happen while it's inside the barrel and then out comes the the plant input that we want to use for the garden. So if you'll, you'll tinker with it, play with it. Um, the super labs are going to give you the recipe for in a second because I'm sure you're thinking about that right now. But uh, if you're interested in helping submit your own findings, um, please check out opennutrientproject.com. If you scroll down to the bottom of the page, if you do test any of these things out for nutrient uh, analysis, which you can do through J.R. Peters uh, in Allentown, Pennsylvania, you can look them up. Um, I don't remember if we have a link to them in this presentation or not. I think we do. If not, there's a link to them on OpenNutrientProject.com. And uh, we have a submission form, and you can tell us what nutrients you found in your own solutions. We have an open source database with other people that have shared theirs. I try to share all my stuff as much as I'm, you know, whenever I get new tests. So uh, be sure to pop on there and check it out. We also have a ton of nutrient resources so that you can have a better idea of what type of nutrient mixes you're making. If you do create something like this, we already have a bunch of data on plant inputs and things like that that we've managed to source from other sort of material online uh, that, uh, that was openly available and then put that into a central database so that you can best decide uh, what nutrients, uh, based on nutrient content, what plants in your property to utilize for fermentation uh, and kind of to help build a nutrient solution that might work for you. So uh, IMO collection, so um, you can check this out here. This is a, uh, a rice collection that we did um, in Oklahoma. As you can see, this one's not quite finished yet, just about there, and um, getting colonized with the fungi. Uh, we put out these uh, rice boxes where we cook the rice about 80%, 85% of the way, uh, and then uh, put them in these boxes. Now, the last six months or so, I've moved away from the boxes and over to baskets. I really think baskets are the way to go, especially they're cheaper and easier to come by here in Thailand. Um, but we've had just much better luck with with, with healthy collections and, and fewer fail rates with the, the baskets versus the um, the wooden boxes. So we've, we've stopped using the wooden boxes entirely here in Thailand and shifted over completely to the baskets. So baskets are also harder for snakes to hide under, which is a big problem here. So. Uh, you know, there's there's more than one reason why we're switching, but uh, I, re I do think that the baskets are the better way to go, having now tried many different methods, um, hands down it's the better way to go.
Um, IMO can help eliminate many different types of diseases uh, and pathogens um, and viruses. I know Chris Trump has seen it uh, work for mosaic virus and tomato, vi uh, tomato plants and, and successfully um, at least stop the visual expression of the virus uh, in the plant. And then um, it also increases flavonoids, terpenes, cannabinoids, secondary you know, compounds that the plant uses to defend itself or taste better. Um, so, you know, definitely think about this if you're just trying to up your game in your garden and, and get more diversity is, is it's the best thing you could put in your garden. It really is. And I think a lot of people get exposed to KNF on the lactobacillus side. Lacto is great, but IMO really can do stuff that even lacto can't in terms of in boosting plant health, vigor and, and disease resistance. And you can see here um, we put out a, a IMO box, um, you know. Got a, a nice good collection there where everything's covered in that nice fungi and then uh, put that in there. So um, you're going to take your IMO box, once you cook the rice about 80% of the way, put it out in the forest, you're going to put it, find a nice tree or find a nice patch of area that hasn't been disturbed with lots of plant material and duff underneath of it that where the, the leaf material is kind of being broken down by fungi, that's where you want to put it. We also, one of the other things that, that um, uh, is important too is taking a couple pieces of mycorrhizae that you find on the ground from something that's already being broken down and sticking them in the very top part of the the basket uh, the box or basket so slipping it underneath that paper towel um, before you fully set them down can be a great way to increase diversity too find a couple of the really strong strains of of mycelium that are already kicking butt and taking names and put that in the right directly on top of the rice to give you an instant start on the top and, and help prevent some of the tri, you know occasional trichoderma contamination things like that if you have all of that mycorrhizae just tearing through that thing from from day one it tends to have a, a lower failure rate um uh, you also collect the native fungi bacteria archaea all these other things by do, utilizing this method uh, and we also where we talk about a diverse uh, there's another way that you can modify this method that we're going to talk about in a second um, but um, uh, it really is a really wonderful way and, and this was originally developed by master cho um, oh before him even in japan but uh, master cho is the one who really helped get the word out on this and natural farming side of things so once you have your rice fully collected after about five days sitting in the forest you're going to go ahead and mix that uh, with sugar so you're going to weigh the fungi and make 50 percent of the oh, 50 50 sugar and fungi so whatever weight so if the fungi is 300 grams you're going to weigh 300 grams of sugar you're going to blend it all together until you get this nice uh cereal sugary cereal looking rice mix that you got there and what this does is the sugar locks out the oxygen in the fungal spores and archaea and bacteria and allows a lot of them to go back to what is called like a seed state so they, they kind of like uh, are put on ice, like they're in suspended animation, basically, uh, for lack of a better term, or many of them are at least. So you can take that, now it's shelf stable, so you can keep that for three or four years if you want to and use that to seed your batches. I know we, we make it here like every other month and just make really large batches that fill up like half a trash can. Um, so this way we can, you know, not have to make it so often. And that can be a great way to do collections. You also want collections of different types of years. So if you have a certain type of climate at a certain type of year, Make, make sure you're doing collections to all those different types of, of environmental factors so that you can get those different diversities of, of species or even do it once a month and then make sure that you're, you're adding a month or two before and after when you're adding and inoculating in the future from the previous year. So all of those things can be done to, to increase biodiversity of your system. Uh, you're then going to use this as your base mix when you're brewing up for making um, you know liquid IMOs or you can take this and directly add it to your MBBR filters or your sump tanks or your mineralization tanks in order to increase the mineralization of those uh, things or increase the biofiltration in the case of the MBBRs. Liquid indigenous microorganisms. So this is made from adding IMO2, a little humic acid, a little sugar, uh, and little labs. I don't always put the labs in anymore. Uh, in fact, I, I don't really put it in anymore, but um, we used to use it quite heavily when I was uh, when I were trying to treat a certain problem in, in the NFT system. So, NFT systems, like lettuce systems, uh, sometimes can be uh, uh, pretty prone to to um, pythium in the summertime when it gets hot. So, you're able to utilize that to help stop that from happening. Um, but uh, ignore the labs on there. I do. I should have should have fixed that. Anyways, um, best way to increase microbial biodiversity system maximizes mineralization. 
kind of touched on all these things. And you can see the roots that it gives on those plants is just amazing. So fermented plant liquid IMO. So this is another methodology that I want to kind of expose you guys to. And this is developed by a gentleman who's not super far from me right now uh, in uh, Vietnam. His name is uh, Quoc Con Pham. And uh, he's a really cool guy. He worked on uh, a whole methodology where he took and made liquid IMO, just like we talked about, and then fermented plant material in that for 90 days or more. So he was filling up drums of plant material and then doing a 1 to 20 to a 5 to 20 ratio of plant inputs of liquid IMO, allowing the material to dissolve and evaporate down a little bit, and then adding more plant material every 30 to 45 days as it liquefied. And then after three to six months, you reach these super high dense nutrient densities uh, where the plants uh, have been broken down and you have these hyper bioavailable uh, nutrients in the 60 to 80,000 parts per million ranges. Um, he did all of his tests utilizing a HANA multimeter. Um, and uh, he's a really cool dude. You can check out uh, Growing a Fish's podcast 251 uh, if you want to check out uh, his interview with him talking all about it. Um, but can be a great way if you're trying to organically produce high uh, potassium, calcium, and iron levels, and a bunch of other things that traditionally you always get from synthetic fertilizers. Um, this can be a great way to kind of bioaccumulate that, uh, utilizing stuff that you have on your farm, uh, and utilizing things like Dr. Duke's database or Open Nutrient Project's database. Uh, in order to source all those materials to create a liquid balanced nutrient solution that might work better for you on your organic farm. Apparently the birds here also want to be in the presentation. I apologize if that's bothering you, but uh, we are in the tropics. There's nothing much I can do about that one. <laughs> um, we've also, he's also done uh, one kg of fish to 20 liters of water to create a quick acting nitrogen fertilizer as well. So. There's all different types of stuff that you can do um, when you're when you're brewing this stuff up and different ways that you can do it. Um, I haven't personally had a lot of experience with nitrogen fertilizer like that, uh, but uh, he swears by it and did all that for off, uh, decoupled systems. So definitely another option that you can utilize for that if you're looking for another way to go about that. So next up, we're, now that you've learned about IMO and we have a rough idea on how to make it, you can check out my channel or Chris Trump's channel. We both have videos on, on how to uh, to make that stuff. Our master Cho has a great thing on that. Any wherever source you want for IMO, um, you know, go ahead and check that out or, or utilize the guide in this. All right, so we're going to modify that into a bioweapon against insects. So <laughs> what we're going to do is, instead of doing all rice for our rice collection in the forest, we're going to take a third of that and replace it with insect corpses, be it crickets or insect frass or crab and, and lobster meal. Um, any chitin heavy uh, material, that's what we're after. But ideally insects, if you can get crickets, if you can pay the local neighborhood kids, you know, a quarter per bug or whatever you can do to get your hands on, a, you know, a pound or two of bugs, that's going to be your best bet, especially if they're local stuff or make some insect traps and collect them yourself uh, with a light and a bucket of water or whoever it is you want to go about collecting them. Um, that's going to be your better bet. So uh, we're going to take that and then we're going to collect the local fungi in the forest that feed on those uh, insects and that break down that chitin and, and gather those and propagate those. And then we're going to utilize that in order to kill off the bugs that we don't want in our garden. So when and why would you use IPMO? So it's really good against larger arthropods, stink bugs, grasshoppers, beetles, weevils, uh, leafhoppers, um, wasps, and scale. Also, will kill bees, so be mindful of that. Um, we're going to show you pictures of that here in a minute, but uh, just it's not like a it doesn't ignore pollinators. Let's put it that way. Um, but think of it as a brew your own Riveria bassiana or a Seriphimus eraceae. That's kind of the best option. It does work on things that they don't work on, though, like grasshoppers and other larger arthropods. It seems to really do a number on because you're kind of getting multiple species of 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 things to attack it. You got stuff that's going to break down the chitin, you have stuff that's going to directly try to infect it, and then you have stuff that wants to break down its insides all in one compound. You also have the added advantage of the fact that we created this and the fungi was breaking down the uh, chitin that was already in there. It's now unlocked that and converted that to chitinase, which also helps boost the plant's immune system and, and give them a secondary you know, resistance to a lot of the stuff uh, as a base, you know, baseline. So it, it really is a really cool solution. And frankly, like we've been making that over a regular IMO for a while, um, just because it seems to have better plant vigor uh, in, increase. So target insect plus insect frass 
to create about 30% of the biomass of your rice, or the weight of the rice for that. And then the other 70% is the rice. I'm then going to go ahead and put that out for collection uh, and then mix that with sugar the same way. And then we're going to turn it, uh, to, you know, spray it on the plants and then turn your bugs into little mummies like that guy. And here's your IPMO uh, uh, recipe for IMO, uh, IPMO2. Um, so this is just taking it, doing the collection, um, cutting at 50% with sugar, stabilizing it, letting it sit for a few days to, to finish stabilizing, uh, and then utilizing that as a, a, a liquid addition. Uh, now we brew this up at least every three waterings. We add this to the water for the irrigation system. So um, we will add this to, we do a, a, a plant fermented fertilizer, then we do a, um, this, the fungi tea, and then we do a regular old plain old water with nothing in it. Uh, and that's our rotation for our fertigation here. And it works extremely well. We don't have any fungal problems at all in our gardens whatsoever. Um, they out compete everything in there. And this seems to do a number on the bottom. I mean, we, other than the occasional grasshopper or whatever that lives for a day or two when he first gets in there, we don't have any problems. Um, when I was in Zimbabwe, uh, we originally came up with this methodology because uh, I, well, when COVID hit, I, they cut, they closed the borders in Zimbabwe, right? So I had no ability to import anymore any kinds of, of pest control goods. You know, I couldn't import by um, beneficial insects. I couldn't import biocontrols from South Africa. So we had to, we got suddenly cut off because we used to do a run every two weeks down on the border to pick up stuff. And um, so we didn't know what to do. So I called Chris. And I was like, hey, what do I do? Like, what do you got for me for like DIY pest stuff? And he, we got grasshoppers that are eating the Cambrian layers off of all of our plants here. So he was like, well, try this. I noticed this that kills weevils in, in my garden and beetles. Uh, why don't you give it a whirl and see if it'll work for you? And it worked, like, totally worked really well in Zimbabwe. We had about 10 hectares planted at the time, and uh, we were getting slowly overrun with those grasshoppers. And after spraying, within two weeks, it was pretty hard to find them in the field. They were there flying into the field, but they didn't live very long once they did. You know, they were just doing regular applications. You also can utilize this really well because you can spray this all around the garden, right? You're only taking microbes from your garden and your for local forested area and reapplying them in a higher concentration to your garden or forested area. So you can spray this all around the garden, in the trees near the garden, on the yard near the garden, in the walkways around the garden, and, and kind of inoculate that with these microbes to help kill anything as it comes into the, into the area that you want to keep them out of. Uh, and not have to worry about the fish, your children, the goats, the dog. You know, you're not putting anything out there that isn't already existing there naturally. So you can feel good about applying it and, and what you're doing in your garden. Here's the uh, IMO 3 and 4 version um, so that you guys can utilize that. I'll give you guys a minute or two to screenshot that. Um, I'm not going to walk through the whole thing. It's just too many steps. But um, I did write this out and it does work well. This is it's basically exactly what we're doing here at the scale that we're operating at now. Again, here's the... The next part of it, part two, the IMO 3.4. And you can see that we have, uh, it's not that much different from IMO. It's very similar to IMO. We just add extra insect frass and insects to the, the IMO 3 portion. And then there's part three, just finishing it up. Hopefully that gives you guys a good basis to work with. And again, if you need to modify or change something, like go go for it. Be careful though with bees. It will kill bees, uh, as you can see here. <laughs> so here's the liquid IPMO recipe that I really like to do. We utilize this again every uh, every third watering. It's part of our watering program. We also use this as a foliar spray too. So we'll spray the plants and water it in at the same time. We'll just make a big batch of it. And, use it for both, but it, it seems to work extremely well. Uh, and we've utilized this outdoors in Oklahoma and in Zimbabwe. Um, you're utilizing it here outdoors and in the greenhouses in Thailand, and it's been working just as good here as it did in Africa or Oklahoma. So it doesn't matter what part of the world you live, you can make your own bio biocontrols um, in a way that, well, it's not gonna kill your spider mites, but it will kill pretty much everything else. Not everything else, but a large range of stuff. So, this is another cool method I wanted to touch on in this presentation. So I was watching my, I have a nice, really cool koi beta, koi beta 
uh, that I managed to pick up at the local market in Thailand here. And I was feeding her ants the other day, and she didn't eat all of her ants. And um, some of them went to the bottom, and I noticed they, within like 40, 24, 48 hours, grew a really thick fungi on it. And it made me wonder, like, what is growing so quickly on this thing? And clearly it's feeding on this uh, ant. So I got a bunch of ants, put them in some water, uh, and, and distilled water. Uh, not, uh, we wouldn't use, wouldn't use chlorinated water, obviously. Um, uh, that would be bad. Um, but using distilled water or just rainwater or, you know, dechlorinated water would work too. Um, put them in there and soaked them. And then after about three or four days, uh, we went and took an air stone, stuck that in there, and uh, brewed it up for about 60 minutes. And then put that in a, a big uh, sprayer and then just sprayed it on a couple, of, uh, a couple of plants and then sprayed it on a couple of test bugs. So we had a, a couple beetles, some ants and a couple of grasshoppers that we put in the big mason jars with, you know, some live plants and stuff so they had something to eat. Um, the ants and the uh, beetles died, the grasshoppers did not. Um, so, um, but it killed the ants really well, whereas IPMO will kill ants, but not quickly. Um, so that was an interesting, you know, uh, trial. Uh, again, we just did this like two weeks ago, so uh, I don't have any more data on that than that, but it is extremely easy to make. And um, it might be another way for you to diversify your liquid IPMO. If you're looking for another weapon in your toolbox, this could offer you another method of collecting local fungi and aquatic methodology uh, and then reapplying them with the plants. Again, full disclaimer, just started playing with this. It just came out of an idea from the beta uh, of the other week and, um, and just started tinkering. But something else to try, something else that's a bit different uh, and, and a different species of microbes than what you're going to collect with the IPMO that we talked about earlier. Again, trying to get the diversity there is what's going to give you the best results when you're fighting many different types of insects that we are here in Thailand, where we have, you know, half the tropical insects on the planet that, <laughs> that exist in Asia or in freaking Thailand. It's nuts. And you wouldn't believe, I mean, we had a rhinoceros beetle on the, one of the outdoor plants the other day that was like five, six inches long. It was pretty cool, but I immediately took it off the plant and was like, you need to go somewhere else. Um, <laughs> So here's the, uh, pro here's the protocol for that. It's gonna give you a, an option to try. You know, again, I, results may vary. Um, let me know how it does. If you, if you do this, please uh, post it and let me know or tag me on IG. And let me know how it worked out for you. You know, did it kill the stuff that you're trying to kill? Did it not kill them? What, what were your results? Other IMOs to uh, ideas to try. Um, infusing your rice with things like um, pre-soaking in kelp or humic acid or powdered aloe. Um, all of those things can work pretty well when you're soaking the rice and cooking it. Um, coconut water instead of regular water can be used as well. That was another one that someone reached out to me with. And uh, we're certainly uh, been do trialing that a little bit here in Thailand. And we had uh, really good results with the first trial. We're going to try it again and see what it does with the second one. And additional gra uh, grains such as oats, quinoa, or other things uh, can help diversify your collection. Um, I know that uh, some people are averse to that, but we haven't seen any negative results with that. Now, in Thailand, it's easy enough for us to, and cheap enough for us to get rice, but uh, I'm, I'm literally surrounded by rice fields, so it's, it's not very expensive here. But, um, <laughs> uh, but plant ferments with LIMO solutions can also be another one which we talked about earlier, and then aquatic IMOs, uh, which we talked about at my uh, virtual aquaponic cannabis conference presentation last year. We have a, a breakdown of the five different liquid I, uh, aquatic IMO collections and methods that you can do on there if you want to check that video out. I also have a long format video on IPMO. It's about 20 minutes long where we go through the exact methods and preparations that we do here in Thailand. Um, you know, obviously we went and bought a kilo of crickets at the market. You probably can't do that where you are, but you can certainly go to the pet shop and get them. So um, certainly if you go at the end of the week before they get their next round of crickets, a lot of times they'll give you the free ones. So um, just you know, consider that as an option if you're trying to collect your crickets. Um, super labs, and so we talked about this earlier in terms of, of breakdown fermentation. Here's some more examples of different batches that we've done. Again, all utilizing the same recipe, uh, breaking down that kelp and the, uh, the spirulina. The one advantage I would say to adding, you can do this with just the spirulina without the kelp, but there seems to be a faster plant uptake and plant vigor response when you add the kelp as well as the spirulina. Um, but it will work with just spirulina, but it doesn't work as well with just the kelp. Uh, it doesn't seem to have the same 
compounds in it. You really do need the spirulina to, to, to get the best, uh, the best results. Here's the recipe for the super labs so that you guys can go ahead and utilize that in your own garden. Um, this is really good for resurrecting dead plants. We had peppers that my ex didn't water for three days. Part of the reason why she's my ex. And um, we, uh, the leaves were so dry, they were like crumbly, like paper almost, you know, turned to dust if you crumble them. Well, I was like freaking out. So I just watered a bunch of the super labs and, and all of them. And within three days, we had new branches coming out of every dead leaf node. And we resurrected about 70% of the plants uh, by utilizing that. So, you know, I don't know of anything else that'll do that. That isn't, you know, some kind of chemical stimulant. So it can be a really good way if you have a plant, maybe a field that got hit real hard with hail, a field that got hit real hard with insects or bird damage or something else. This can be a really good way to, um, you know, quickly bounce those plants back and get them back in it on track for production. So, um, or something got beat up in transport, just whatever. You got a plant that just needs the help. Um, you can utilize this. And again, application rates are looking at one to one to 10 for foliar and then a one to 20 for top dress. Uh, and then for, you know, aquatic systems, a one to 1000, if you're going to water it into the root zone with the hydroponics or aquaponics. So uh, definitely check it out. It's a really cool um, solution. Again, you, you might find some other combinations that have, have stuff that works even better than this. That's why I kind of encourage people to kind of get away from the rigidness of, of natural farming. I think natural farming is a lot of misconceptions where they're like, oh, we're not worried about NPK. Well, why not? The NPK is hyper bioavailable in all these fermented solutions. We need to map out what's going on there so you don't have, you know, toxicities or imbalances and ratios so that you don't have lockout or anything like that. Like, there's nothing about the plant inputs that make them immune to the chemistry, right? Like, there's chemistry is chemistry. It doesn't matter if using salts or fermented plant inputs, it's still the same chemistry. And I think that something is, is extremely frustrating. Um, the other thing too is people just wanting to stick to the Master Cho method, diversify from it. And you can see some of the amazing inputs that we've talked about so far in this, this uh, presentation, get away from that rigid thinking and, and more into the idea of utilizing what's on your property to create what you need. So, um, okay, so nutrient testing liquids in-house. So if you're looking to test your own stuff, uh, Aquarium Pharmaceuticals, HANA, Lamote, Seachem, Salifert, Milwaukee, Blue Labs, uh, all those are really, really great. Um, you know, uh, it can offer you a wide range of different stuff. Now, if you're really worried about um, accuracy, Lamote and Hanna really are the best. Um, the other advantage to the Hanna meters is that they, none of them require color. So if you're colorblind or have students or patients or uh, children that are colorblind, uh, Hanna really is going to be your better bet because it gives you a digital readout. Uh, Lamote has t test kits for pretty much anything. Some of them are a bit pricey, but um, you can test for pretty much or quantify pretty much any nutrient that you want at the home scale or small commercial scale with the equipment. And also go to aptestkit.com and check out the uh, a wide range of different nutrients that we have available in terms of nutrient tests. Uh, you know, you can see the nutrient range, the different kits, the pH, uh, the test kits per box, the prices, manufacturer, manufacturer link, uh, retail link, all that's available on the website as well as commercial testing options. If you're trying to test your own stuff. Now, one of the things I want to touch on too is you can absolutely overdo it in organics. Now, this is a test came from an organic certified aquaponics facility um, that was misinformed about how to go about dosing the nutrients the cannabis needs in aquaponics. Um, as you can see here, they were at four times the legal limit for arsenic. So, uh, just because an input's organic doesn't mean that it's good for you. Um, you have to be careful and you can't overdose things. But all of this stuff we managed to link back to overdosing kelp that seems to be the easiest way to overdose arsenic and you'll know immediately if that's the cause because uh, look at the boron uh, if you test the boron and you look at the boron levels boron and arsenic will always be heavily uh, elevated if they overused kelp um, you, you, there aren't any kelps that have low boron levels so uh, that can be the easiest telltale sign that they're you know even if someone's not being honest with you about what happened exactly what went on if you don't see the boron levels and there's another arsenic source either um possibly some some rock dust or from a um, you know sometimes even the natural mineral i know certain ground formations in oklahoma are, are almost at legal limit or over legal limit in arsenic so if you were growing directly in native soils uh, you could potentially depending on the local geology uh, have issues with that as well um, supplements must be chosen wisely and balanced wisely and again don't overuse anything organic or otherwise just don't go crazy 
Um, that seems to always be when people have the major issues is they just some random quote unquote guru told them this is how you do it and they just went nuts. Um, if you're trying to figure out how to balance your ferments and nutrient solutions, Duke's phytochemical database is really good, especially if you're into ethnobotanical pharma pharmacology and creating your own fun compounds. It's also good for that too. Um, but you can, you can find all different types of things, especially if you're trying to find mineral content and, you know, chemical compound content of different plants. Um, we also have a modified version of that called Open Nutrient Project. We've taken that data as well as a bunch of other open source data and combined it into one single place that is all sorted by, you know, mineral content. So potassium, um, phosphorus, nitrogen, blah, 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 blah. So that you can just say, okay, I need potassium. And then click that and then look at the average, all sorted by minimum average, excuse me, parts per million. And figure out what it is in your yard that you need to, to harvest to get the potassium levels that you want in your mix and then phosphorus and so on and so forth. Uh, and then same thing with heavy metals, which plants are going to be a concern, which plants are fine um, and, and all that stuff. And then also just a bunch of other random ones where we managed to find content lists that were open source that had, okay, here's the plants and here's what um, was in the compounds um, uh, uh, or different compounds and minerals that were in those plants at different levels. So, um, but they didn't have the PPM data what they just had a has a nitrogen high nitrogen high phosphorus So that's also there um, So we have just a ludicrous amount of different things as well as nutrient levels for all these different types of organic inputs uh, Over 200 different organic inputs have uh, the nutrient compound nutrient, you know rough from other people's lab tests uh, what, What's in there? So really helps you kind of demystify a lot of these organic inputs and help you build an organic solution be a compost or ferments or teas. I don't, you know, whatever tribe, KNF, Jadam, whatever tribe of organic that you come from, you can utilize this resource uh, to help further refine your methods and, and really help, you know, get rid of those mystery, um, you know, deficiencies and things like that. And you can see here, uh, again, you, you can click on the Latin name and it'll immediately give you a link back to the original source material. Uh, wherever we source it, or it'll be at the top of the section, depending on how, uh, which page you're looking at. So we also have all the tests. So once you create your ferments, your teas, composts, we now have all the ability, the lists of how, so you can test it and quantify it. And then we also have a form at the end of the page uh, so that you can um, submit your own data. So let's just say you made blueberry ferment with lactobacillus and you fermented the blueberries, and now you went and you got the test kits. You're, you're, you're mostly concerned about these nutrients, whatever, whatever. So you get the test kits that you need. You test for the nutrient ranges and nutrient levels of that different, you know, your, your blueberry extract. Uh, maybe it's really high, so you have to do a low resolution test. So you cut it 50% with distilled water to get you that into the range that you need for your test kit. Now you have an idea of what nutrient, or maybe you sent it off to J.R. Peters, and they can give you the nutrient analysis and parts per million with their equipment. Now you have the nutrient content for that. Now you can go into the web page and at the bottom there's a little form, submit that to, to the open source database that we have on the website. And then it, you can also immediately check out what other inputs other people have had and what the nutrients were, what the preparations were, what inputs they used. Um, you know, any information that they chose to include on that is all available there. So uh, if you are interested in help participating, help demyst demystifying a lot of the nutrient ranges, nutrient uh, components to these things, um, which I really feel like is being underemphasized with a lot of these inputs, um, please feel free to contribute. We are looking for more people to help us, um, you know, always looking for more data. Um, so if you, or if you have access, you know, you happen to know of some cool links uh, and data that we can put into the machine, um, we're always happy to, uh, to do that. And it's always be free, open source. You can check it out on your phone. You can download the page onto your cell phone if you want to, so that you have it offline. Um, you know, it, it's designed to be an open tool. If someone's really good at apps and you want to help me make an app for it, uh, we'd love to make that into the, something like that in the future. And we have the Growing With Fishes podcast, over uh, eight, seven, 800 hours of, of um, educational content uh, from all, the last, whew, shoot, seven years now uh, we've been doing the show. So uh, we've had a, a really, really wide range of amazing educators, including Matt Powers and Chris Trump and uh, a whole bunch of uh, Elaine Ingham and a bunch of other people that are a part of this conference as well. So just a, a really wonderful uh, um, uh, platform that we've had over the years to, to help share and educate people on regenerative practices, uh, you know, a large percentage revolving around living soil and aquaponics, but sometimes other things as well. So definitely check that out. 
It's available on all the platforms. Uh, and then I have uh, my, you know, growing APMJ class, which is our aquaponic uh, cannabis class, the podcast, for, and we have the APMJ newts if you're looking for that. We have um, uh, the Facebook group, um, Dempier Certified Educator, um, and a whole bunch of other resources for you guys as well. So um, feel free, free, please feel free to uh, to reach out to me if you have a question or you want to learn, check out more, um, you want to help work on any of the, the open source projects that I'm working on right now, um, we'd love to hear from you. So thank you so much for your time, and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Have a good one. Thanks, Matt, for putting on this super amazing conference. <laughs>